years from 1848 to 1854, they had four children. Now, he had a military life. He was assigned to several posts. First, he was assigned to the Oregon Territory after the Mexican War. And he couldn't take his wife and infant son at that time with him. They just didn't let you do that. They had to stay behind. So he's a military man. So after the Mexican War and after his marriage, he's assigned to several different posts. First, he was sent to the Oregon Territory, but he had to leave his wife and their infant son behind, their first child. So he'd take him with them. Why did they let him take the territory? The Oregon Territory was kind of a rough area at the time, you know what I mean? Yeah. And they weren't that interested in having women and children at the post because of that. Yes. Who? No, I think I think she is on a field trip. Well, that's what I have in my book. Okay. Well, in answering Colt's question, it just wasn't the place for women and children at these outposts that were so far away. Maybe if he was in St. Louis, they would have done it. Yeah, but out in the Oregon Territory, no. Well, because of this, not being able to take his wife and child, he became very lonely, and he became depressed, and he started doing some heavy drinking, which people did when they were depressed in those days. So he developed his drinking habit, which he really had his entire life, because of his loneliness and depression away from his wife and child when he was in the Oregon Territory. So he became very lonely and depressed, which resulted in some very heavy drinking. Well, in the summer of 1853, in the summer of 1853, he was promoted to the rank of captain, and he was transferred to a fort in Northern California. Okay? So in the summer of 1853, he was promoted to the rank of captain, and he was transferred to a fort in Northern California. Again, not being able to take his wife and family with him because of the remoteness, so to speak, of California. Well, he didn't like it there. He didn't like the situation. He had several run-ins with his commanding officer during his time in California. And finally, on July 31st of 1854, what does he do? Because he has several run-ins with his commanding officer, he doesn't like Army life anymore being away from his family. On July 31st of 1854, he resigns from the military and goes back to St. Louis. So as a result, on July 31st, 1854, he resigns from the military and returns to St. Louis. So, so far, is he like this military wonder? Not even, not even close. And he resigns from the military because he doesn't like military life anymore. So what's he got to do when he gets back to St. Louis? Find a job. Very good. And this is... He had a hard time doing that. I'm going to just go through a list of things he tried to do. Okay? When he got back, remember I said, uh, I didn't tell you that. So I'll just skip that. I didn't tell you that his father-in-law had some land in St. Louis. Well, the first thing he did when he got back is he unsuccessfully worked a small farm that was given to him by his father didn't like, didn't do very good farming. So the first attempt he made at a normal civilian life was he unsuccessfully worked on a small farm that was given to him by his father. That didn't work for him at all. Then he went into real estate. And he didn't do very well there either. He fails at the farming business, goes into real estate, doesn't do very well in there, Tried to get a job as a clerk in St. Louis, didn't get it, didn't get the job. So he unsuccessfully works on a small farm that was given to him by his father-in-law, that doesn't work out. He goes into the real estate business, that doesn't work out. He tries to apply for a lowly clerk job in St. Louis, can't get the job. And finally, to support his family, 
he was reduced to selling firewood on a St. Louis street. And you wouldn't think that would be Ulysses S. Grant, would you? That's what he did, though. He, he had to support his family by cutting and selling firewood on the streets of St. Louis. Now think about this, an ego. Finally, in 1860, he goes back to work where? No. Think about it. Huh? No? What does dad own? His dad. Tannery. tannery. He went back to work at his father's tannery, supervised by his two younger brothers. I mean, how low, I mean, seriously, how bad could it get? So he didn't do very well after his military career, and his military career wasn't that fabulous either. And he finds himself in 1860 working for his dad, supervised by his two younger brothers. So, here we go. Because of this and his life in the... He was more than happy to volunteer as one of those 75,000 volunteers when Lincoln asked for him after the fall of Fort Sumner. He was thrilled to death to get back in because he had nothing going for him. And the rest is military history. Because of his successes in the Civil War, we know him as we know him today, right? This great, great war general and President of the United States. Well, let's tell you a little bit about that. He was elected in 1868, right? We told you that. He was re-elected in 1872. And he was willing to be re-elected in 1876, but he lost the Republican nomination. You know why? He was too old. Historians will tell you that Ulysses S. Grant might have been, if not the worst, but one of the worst presidents in American history. More scandals came about during his administration which we'll talk about some of those when we get into the uh, Native American unit. But he had scandal after scandal after scandal during his administration. And historians would tell you that he probably, if not the worst, would rank in the bottom five of the worst presidents we ever had. Okay? Now, so, what happens to him? After he loses that nomination in 1876, he gets cancer and he's dying of cancer. And he spends his time writing and selling his memoirs. What's he going to do with those memoirs? He's going to take the money and do what? Make sure his family can live comfortably after he's gone. So knowing he was dying of cancer, Grant spent his time writing and selling his memoirs, planning to sell them so his family could live comfortably after his death. You know who published his memoirs? You know who his publisher was? Mark Twain. Oh my goodness. Mark Twain was his publisher. And his memoirs sold at the time for $500,000, which would be about 12 or 13 million today. So he sold these. He sold these. I actually have first edition copies back there in that case. He sold them for $500,000, which would be probably anywhere from 12 to 15 million in today's dollars. So you have all those, like, we're talking much right now? No, no, he sold all, he, when he, they were print, I have one of many. But when he sold all those memoirs to publishers, he got 500000 Then the publishers took them and sold the books. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, my books are worth a lot, hundreds of dollars. Now, he dies, finally, on July 23rd of 1885. July 23rd of 1885. Anybody want to guess where he's buried? Grants too. We buried Grants too. <laughs> July 23rd, 1885. Nope, he's buried actually in New York City. I don't know. 
And his wife, Julia, lived until 1902. She lived almost, you know, 20 years, 17 years longer after he died, and she's buried at his side in New York City. As I mentioned, although a very popular president, historians would argue that he may have been the worst president of the United States this country's ever had. His administration was filled with corruption, and his cabinet was considered the worst in American history. The people in his cabinet were considered the worst cabinet in American history. Okay, tomorrow's Wednesday, right? Yeah. We're going to have a little worksheet for you tomorrow, which will basically be what? The test. The test. And the test will be Thursday. Okay? There we go. So, a few sheet tomorrow, you'll have the period to work on that. And the test will be Thursday. Yep. Why did you leave? She died in 19... Uh, Check it out. Thank you. Do you need a pencil for the rest of the day? Oh, uh, no, I got shop next. Oh, okay. You don't need it? Okay, remember, review tomorrow, test Thursday.